Joey, there's a handful of things that you can learn from billionaires. In this episode, we're going to give you three. <laughs> I think you should always listen when billionaires are speaking, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, just to be clear, we're not interviewing a billionaire on this podcast. We do have some billionaires have been on our podcast. And I will concur that the information that was shared today by Ben Frazier, our guest, was in line with the things that we've heard. We talk about the three lessons that he has learned through following and reporting on on his podcast, Invest Like a Billionaire, which are these three. One, business owners and billionaires are one of the kind, right? They, they tend to go hand in hand. Secondly, billionaires love buying real assets, specifically real estate. And third, they invest in alternative investments. Joey, what's an alternative investment? Anything outside of Wall Street. That's why I love this interview, by the way. Well, yeah, oil and gas, right? Energy would be an alternative asset, but that would be something that we all need access to, right? Technology could be an alternative investment. There are so many ideas that you're going to gain from being a part of this call. We love uh, having this conversation with Ben Frazier. We got a chance to listen to his dad when we were at an event recently in Dallas. Their uh, Aspen Fund, which is really amazing for those people who are looking for steady income streams. That'd be something that maybe you're interested in. You may want to check them out. But Stallion, let's jump in right now with this episode with Ben Frazier. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Wealth Without Wall Street Tribe, I'm excited to introduce you to our friend Ben Frazier of Aspen Funds today. Ben, so glad to have you in the studio. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Looking forward to it. Yeah, everybody get ready to invest like a billionaire because we're with the man who runs the billionaire (laughs) podcast himself, man, Ben. Um, So let's talk about that. Let's if I want to invest like a billionaire, do I need to have a billion dollars? Well, that's the great thing. The keyword is like. So, you know, I'm, I'm not quite a billionaire yet. You know, I know it's probably surprising, but um, we can implement a lot of the strategies and tactics that billionaires and ultra wealthy use in our own portfolios. Right. And so they've been investing very differently for the past really several decades than most kind of average you know, individual investors. And uh, yes, yeah, the name of our podcast, Invest Like a Billionaire, that's our whole our whole thesis is investigating and trying to understand what are they doing differently and how can we replicate that, you know, in a smaller, smaller scale. So you guys have been running the podcast for how many years now? Uh, really only about, I'd say one and a half. So just, just kind of started it more recently, but it's, it's been fun. Yeah. All right. So over the last 18 months, I'm sure you've dug into a lot of different billionaires as you've been able to, to, to show kind of what they're doing and how they're doing it. What's one of the biggest eye-opening things that you've seen that has really helped you personally, as well as your audience think and invest like a billionaire? Yeah. Yeah. Well, to kind of take a little step back with my, my background. So, you know, I've uh, got a finance degree, master's in business and kind of went the traditional corporate route and ended up in commercial banking for uh, you know, several years as an underwriter and an analyst and really evaluating, you know, some of the wealthiest clients of this this bank and the businesses they were running, and um, it was a pretty cool way to look under the hood of what are these wealthy people that are, you know, getting twenty million dollar loans from our bank? What are they doing? And you know, every every borrower has to send in their personal financial statement and disclose everything, and so I get to look under the hood and see exactly what's there, and. and you know, looking back, some of the common denominators that I saw kind of across the board of these wealthy individuals was really two things. One was a lot of the most wealthy uh, borrowers at the, of the bank were business owners, number one, being entrepreneurs. And the second was real estate. They had a lot of real estate generally, right? And so it was kind of a, a little bit of a light bulb moment. And then about five years ago, jumped into the kind of world of private equity and uh, raising capital for you know real estate type of deals, and 
you know, it was really kind of this eye-opening moment of, you know, this is how a lot of the wealthy are, are building wealth. So to, to answer your specific question, as we've kind of dug into the research and, you know, we want to replicate things that are working and things that the wealthy are doing because a lot of the mainstream, you know, financial media, it's all basically one path. You know, the 60-40 stock bond portfolio, you know, 401k retirement, stuff it till you're, you know, 62 and a half, and then maybe hopefully have enough, you know, in down the road, you can retire and pull some distributions out. And then hopefully that lasts until you die, right? I mean, that's, that's what everyone's been told you have to do. So we really did the investigation of, well, how are the, how are the ultra wealthy doing it? How are the billionaires doing it? How are the family offices doing it? And they're doing it very differently. And, and generally the biggest difference is alternative investments. They're using alternative investments, alternative being defined as anything outside of traditional stocks, bonds, mutual funds. And from research we found, we have a lot of data on this we talk about on our podcast. Generally, it's at least 50% of a portfolio allocation into these types of alternatives for you know the ultra wealthy, the billionaires, and the family offices. And one of the kind of key pioneers of this model was actually the most successful endowment fund of all time, right? You guys probably have heard about Yale Endowment Fund, right? They were pioneers in this. And at certain points along the way, about 20 years ago, they kind of pioneered this model of um, investing more into private equity, investing more into real estate, investing into hedge funds, investing into uh, venture capital. And by doing that, they created alpha or outperformance against all their peers by massive numbers for a long period of time. And so it was like, wait, what are these guys doing differently? Right. And so uh, that was the key was investing in things outside of these traditional ideas. And, and so what's really changed is in the past, really about a de- almost a decade now, actually just a decade in 2012, the jobs act kind of changed the landscape of access to alternative investments for the average, you know, uh, investor like you and I. And it, it allows the sponsors, the operators of these deals to actually be able to talk about them. Because prior to 2012 in the Jobs Act, you had to have a pre-existing relationship um, with an operator to be able to invest with them. And you um, generally, it went through broker dealer networks and other things. It's very difficult to get access to these. But now with these changes in the regulations, it's totally shifted everything. That's why you're seeing a lot of crowdfunding, right? You're seeing all these different types of things. You're probably being marketed to on Facebook and other you know, platforms with uh, different deals. And that's because the regulation has changed. So that has really transformed the ability for the average investor to be able to invest like the ultra wealthy or like a billionaire. That's so cool. I, I love hearing uh, kind of the evolution of this. And uh, also it's music to my ears, right? That we're taking assets off of Wall Street and putting them on Main Street with operators who are doing um, who are who are diligent and who are making the the right kind of decisions for the investors. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Now, one question I have is based on today's environment. Take it take us from what you know of what billionaires in in general, wealthy ultra wealthy, have been doing. Has there been anything in terms of current trends that have maybe changed that or had them focusing on other aspects of their investing? Uh, talk talk to us about that. Yeah, you know, one of my favorite resources that we follow is uh, called Tiger Twenty One. So Tiger, like the animal, in Twenty One Global, and it's a you know exclusive membership group where you have to have I think at least twenty million dollars of investable assets to be long to this group. And then they do quarterly surveys of all their members. I think they have probably a thousand or a couple thousand members. And it's on what are they investing in? And they do kind of a portfolio allocation pie chart, right? You've kind of seen the 60-40 pie chart. Well, this one has stocks and bonds, but it has about 10 other things in there, which we just talked about, right? All the different alternatives. And it shows, you know, what allocations are over time. And so you can kind of see these these changes in real time from a pretty good uh, data set of ultra wealthy investors. Um, so I love following that. You know, it's, it's interesting because there are always little changes here and there, but predominantly real estate and private equity make up the biggest allocations um, of this group and other groups that we followed, uh, even more than stocks and bonds. Um, and sometimes those allocations change slightly, but I think, you know, that's, it's, they're, they're not dramatic shifts. So you know, obviously the world's a little bit different today than it was two years ago, right? As we're sitting today here in April of 2023, 
you know, interest rates are, are a lot higher than they were a year ago and people are concerned about a recession. So you know, does that change kind of the go forward types of deals that, that investors are looking at? Probably. And we could talk a little bit about, about those kind of trends, but from a high level allocation to these types of alternatives is not changing. And, and actually the projections are to increase uh, pretty substantially over the next really 10 to 20 years. You guys run a fund called Aspen Funds. Give our audience a little bit of background of specifically what Aspen Funds does. Yeah, so uh, my my father actually was one of the founders of Aspen Funds 10 years ago. I don't have to get too much into the story there, but uh, him and his partner, Jim, they were kind of coming out of the great financial crisis, right? And uh, both coming from different different backgrounds. But they found this opportunity, and uh, Jim, his partner, was in real estate for 30 years, had done everything in real estate, and was doing speculative residential development in California during the great financial crisis, right? And we all know what happened to speculative development deals in 08 and got creamed, right? And so he's sitting there thinking, man, how do I, how do I get on the other side of this, this debt equation, right? How do I become the bank? Because all my lenders were fine. I was the one that took, took the wipe um, on these deals. And the kind of light bulb moment uh, kind of happened for him and really started the foundation of really our thesis of how we invest and really the models that we've used for, for that particular fund that you're referring to, which is our income fund, which is a debt fund. And so, you know, our, our approach to investing as Aspen funds is what we call macro driven. And so we're always looking at the trends, like what are happening in the market and uh, what are the fundamentals that are driving demand or supply in certain asset classes and then you know, we've all heard the the idiom a rising tide lifts all boats well how do we get in a rising tide right because if i have a rising tide that's supporting me and a tailwind at my back even if i make a few missteps along the way that's going to be more than covered by the rising tide right and conversely if i'm in a receding tide but i got the best deal and the best market and the best execution it doesn't really matter, right? You can't you can't fight these bigger forces, and that's a great example of that. Is you know residential real estate in 2009, 2010, right? It's it was a bad time to be in the market, you know. And similarly, in you know in uh, 1999, is a great time to be in tech. In 2001, it, you did not want to have a dot com behind your name, right? And so that we understand intuitively as investors, there's these cycles, right? But we're always being told you always got to be investing, you always got to be investing. And what that generally means is just investing into your mutual fund, right? Because it's always a good time to buy, but that's that's not the case. There are there are better times to buy certain assets than other times, right? And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand some of these some of these trends. So, um, all that to say, when we started the income fund ten years ago, a great opportunity was buying distressed debt. And uh, as the banks were, you know, not lending anymore, and a lot of these these notes were going bad. As the notes meaning uh, mortgages. We started this fund, started picking these up for for really very big discounts to what they actually owed, and it still is the case today. So you can buy a mortgage at a discount to what is owed by the borrower. That does a few things. One, it creates capital protection because your basis or your cost of that that mortgage is a lot lower than what they owe, and so you likely have more equity cover in your position. And two, it increases your yield. Right. So if I have a hundred thousand dollar mortgage that is say six percent rate. If I buy it for $50,000, my effective yield on that is double. It's 12%, right? Because I have it at a discount. So because of that, uh, we've created a fund and it's you know approaching $100 million. We've been building it just slow and steady over the past 10 years. Um, that's all equity pretty much uh, funded. And just buying these mortgages and holding them for cash flow. And so uh, it's, it's a, a debt fund. We're buying the debt. We're becoming the bank. I know you guys like like being the bank as well. And so it's it's been a, a really cool strategy to be a very a good bedrock for a lot of investors' portfolios. Well, I, I wanted you to share that because in context to you were talking about the trends, where you see investors investing, right? And with an environment right now, right, I, I'm no uh, – predictor of the future by any stretch, but I would say, hey, it, it doesn't look great, right? Like we're all sitting here going, hmm, may, maybe this thing's got a little little more rockiness out there. And you're talking about tides, right? So if, if anybody's been on a boat and it started rocking, you know what happens next. And I think that we're going to see potentially some of that happening. So 
what are you hearing from investors as they're why are they coming to you? Do you see more people moving into this consistent cash flowing type investment like what you guys have within your income fund because of what's happening in the market and the macro trends? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think, you know, it's it's a few things. So I do believe there is this overall trend of people kind of seeing the light a little bit like, you know, I'm a little burned out from the stock market. You know, it's a lot of volatility. I've been riding this, you know, ups and downs and this roller coaster for a long time. And maybe they're retired or they're approaching retirement and they just they don't want that volatility, right? That is that's hard to stomach sometimes, especially when you're relying on your portfolio to pay your bills. And so I think the overall trend is people are gravitating towards some of these private alternatives, you know, like real estate. Um, and to your point, cash flow in real estate there's not a lot of better options than that for you getting the cash flow, you're, you're, you're getting the, the income along the way, you're getting the appreciation, you can use leverage to your advantage, you get a lot of tax benefits. And, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty hard to compare that uh, to other, other deals. Now to the specific, like in this environment right now, where are we seeing, you know, what, what I'm, um, you know, not to get much into the recession and potential of that. We have a lot of analysis we've done in our podcast, you know, I'm, I'm not as concerned as some people are. I think I think we are definitely up in for some bumps. There's definitely some bumps. Even in commercial real estate, there's going to be some bumps, especially in office, especially in um, multifamily where they have bad debt. I think debt's going to be the driver of a lot of uh, the turmoil, bad debt that is. And you know we're going to see some of these bumps. That that's inevitable when you go into these kind of credit tightening cycles. That that happens. That's just the nature of of how our economy works. But you look at the other side of the coin and we because of the, the COVID stimulus packages that were, you know, basically direct payments to individuals and all the PPP loans that you know, benefited these small businesses. There is an excess savings right now on consumers balance sheets of four trillion dollars. So right now, on average, it sits at about one trillion dollars is the average savings of the consumer. Um, right now, it's at $5 trillion. So an excess savings of $4 trillion sitting on the silence. So consumers, while they're maybe nervous, while they're maybe scared, they've got a lot of cash, more than they've ever had. And so, you know, it begs the question, you know, how deep will the recession go if we do have a recession? I'm on the side that if we do have a recession, it's probably not going to be very deep or very long because of uh, the consumer demand that is just sitting there in a pent up way. And so I think how people are investing now is really driven by a few things. One thing people are scared, um, and that's just what happens when we get into these cycles, right? We don't we don't know what's going to happen, so the first response is to just not do anything. Sometimes that's okay, but right now in this environment, what is driving the interest rate increases, which is driving some of this, this rockiness? Well, it's inflation, right? And inflation is an enemy to savers. It's a massive enemy. And uh, I'm a believer that we're going to see inflation at a higher level for a longer period of time uh, because of some of the components that are driving it. And so if you think about, you know, purchasing power of your cash and you want to have savings, you want to have emergency fund, you want to, you know, whatever your comfort level is with what you have that if you have a you know, infinite banking policy or other things you can use for liquidity, lines of credit, maybe you don't need as much cash, but you don't want to be sitting on tons and tons of cash right now. That's actually not the best thing to do. Um, and so looking for the opportunities that will, uh, you know, have recession resilience and, and hopefully some cash flow are, are very, very key. If you've listened to our show for any length of time, you've heard us talk about infinite banking and how we were able to use that concept to create over $50,000 a month in passive income. But it's just not that easy to figure out how does this all connect into my own personal system? Stallion, that's why we created the Passive Income Operating System, bro. It shows you how to turn active income into passive income. It makes all the steps come together. If you would like to get access to it as a podcast listener, we've never given this away in public before. Go to wealthwhatwallstreet.com forward slash P-I-O-S. There was nothing worse than walking into class when you're in school and the teacher saying, pop quiz day. Why? Because you were unprepared. Are you unprepared, though, for financial freedom? Don't be. Find out how close you are by taking our 30-second quiz at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash quiz. 100%. And I was just about to jump in to say, 
that person that's hearing you say this right now is like, yes, they're, sh- they're nodding their head saying, Ben, I do have capital. It's sitting yep. there and I'm in this awkward position where I have capital, but I'm scared to death because I don't know where to put it. Yeah. Right. And they're all the things you're saying. Inflation is just like they can almost visualize, as Russ always calls it, the termites in their wallet, just eating that <laughs> cash day by day. And they're saying, OK, walk me through. Let, let's just use, for example, the Aspen fund, the debt fund and say, in the event of a recession, what's going to happen? Mm. Like, give me the future, bring the future to the present. Yeah. So, Russ, you're kind of, I think, giving me a softball. I didn't really take it earlier, but, you know, cash flow is king, right? Cash is not king. Cash flow is king. And I'm sure you guys talk about this all the time because I know you're big believers in this. But if you have cash flow, you can ride out a lot of storms, right? The, the, the biggest challenge, like what I'm alluding to, a lot of these commercial real estate deals are in trouble and they got bad debt. Well, what happened was in the past two years, I, I think there's kind of what I call a syndicator bubble, right? Every Joe Schmo that thought he could raise capital from his you know, sphere of influence was going and buying real estate and hey, real estate just goes up, right? And, and they're putting bad debt on it, they're, they're overpaying and they're doing value add uh, strategies um, which have gaps of cash flow early on, right? And what happened was they're buying it with bridge debt, which generally has floating rate debt, and they're buying it highly leveraged. And if they don't hit their projections on the value on the the value that they're creating in these deals, they're going to be in trouble. Um, and so, what, the way I kind of view it, and what we see from a lot of investors, is as we go into a potential more rocky environment, a potential recession. It's important to think about risk adjusted returns, right? And so everyone loves to see that 20 to 25% IRR deal, right? Whatever it is. But the gap for a lot of investors, they, they don't risk adjust that return, right? So how much risk am I taking to get that return that I want? And that's a framework you should always be using when you're evaluating investments, but even more so now. And so what we're seeing is, you know, because people are more risk averse, they're wanting to go further down the capital stack. That's, you know, a phrase some people may be familiar with, some may not. But the idea is in every deal, in every real estate deal, for example, you have a capital stack. And that's just what's the formation of, of the capital that you have to purchase this asset. And so generally you have some senior debt, right? It's from your bank. Maybe you have some mezzanine debt or some, some bridge debt on top of that, junior, junior debt. Maybe you have some preferred equity and then maybe you have common equity. Right? So those are kind of the four most common places in the capital stack. Where are you investing as an investor? Right? Generally, the, the, and those are you know, how they get paid out in reverse order. So the, the senior, senior lender gets paid first, then the junior lender, then the preferred equity and the common equity. So if you're in 100% common equity deals across your portfolio, you actually have a disproportionate risk of your equity being impacted negatively um, if you're only in common equity deals and maybe you're shooting for those big returns and you're younger, you can withstand that. But what you want to be doing is balancing out your portfolio across the capital stack. And as we go into more recession, going down the capital stack, right? Maybe, maybe being willing to take a little bit less risk or a little bit less return, but you're taking less risk to do. To and, do so. and, and you specifically can do that. How? Yeah. So, you know, you think about real estate. So there's there, there's core core plus you know, value add development deals. The the riskier you go, the higher up you get there. The other piece of it is debt, investing in debt. So like our income fund, like we've been talking about, we're buying mortgages, and so we're a secured lender. We have a lien against the properties, and if the borrower doesn't pay us, we can take back the property, right? And so we're a debt fund. So generally, if you're investing in debt, that's a safer investment um, than investing in common equity. And so you can, you know, invest in things that cash flow that have day one cash flow or a really clear path to cash flow, um, or investing further down the capital stack, which would be debt or even preferred equity. There's a lot of preferred equity funds coming out that are, you know, investing in a preferred position in the capital stack where they get paid out before the common equity investors. And uh, so just reducing your, your risk. 
All right, I'm, I'm going to break this down for Joey because I feel like if I get it to Joey, down to my level, come on. If I get it to Joey's level, anyone listening is like, "Oh, I got that." I mean, they they got it a long time ago. They probably got it where you were. But come just, on, let's just pretend Joey's sister's listening and and she, you know, <laughs> he's the one teaching her. Okay, so let's talk about this. So what I just make sure I got it there. If I'm investing, I'm just going to use a, a blanket example. I'm investing into an apartment complex, right? That's a mm-hmm. typical real estate investor that's listening to the podcast, maybe saying, hey, I want to invest into a syndication. I'm going to invest in this real estate deal over here. I'm going to put my $100,000 into it. I'm at the top of the food chain, meaning the last one to eat based upon what you just said. I'm common equity in that deal, most likely. Now, potentially, I could be a preferred equity depending on how the deal was structured. Is that fair? So exactly, far. except you're probably at the bottom of the food chain, not the top of the food chain. Yeah, <laughs> well, you, you were stacking it, so I'm just saying you're at the top, but you want to be at the bottom, right? Like this yeah. is the golf yeah. analogy. Like I want to be go- Joey in golf, not me in golf. Like I have the highest score, and I think I win. I exactly. Live, right. Like exactly. this is an example here. All right. So, but the the side part of that deal is almost every apartment complex we've ever invested in, one of the things we love about it is all the depreciation. And when there's leverage, we get to double our, you know, we get to double that depreciation because we get the leverage of it. Well, technically the person on the bottom, which is really the first one in line for the money, the, the, the debt on the deal is if the thing goes bad, that's who has to get paid first. And we always consider, Oh, that's somebody else. That's going to be a bank. That's yep. not going to be an individual, but that's not true, right? The banks typically are not holding that on their balance sheets. They're turning around and selling it to an investor or to a fund like yourself in some some shape or form where now I could be investing in that, which is producing a cash flow to yep. me. And, you know, like if I was able to get into a deal with you guys where I put in money, maybe even when it pays off, I'm going to get paid a higher return, right? Because I'm, I'm, buying at a discount into the deal. It, it's interesting. I just don't think people catch that. And, and maybe you did, Joey, but I just wanted to make sure that we don't miss the opportunity that there's two ways to be in that same apartment complex, right? Yeah. I could be the, the the equity, but also potentially I could be in the debt position. And as we get into shaky situations, the debt position starts to look a lot better. Is that close to accurate, Ben? Yeah, you, you're, the, the concepts are spot on. So just to be clear, though, our our, our fund invests only in single family mortgages. Um, it's actually to invest in apartment debt is a little bit of a different game. Those are generally traded at, you know, CNBS level. So like big, you know, institutional level. And they're very, very low yields generally. But uh, the, the, the concept is absolutely right in that you can you can pick where you want to be in the capital stack depending on on uh, the type of deal you're investing in. And it's important too to, to think at a, at a more holistic level as an investor of, I'm with you guys, I love depreciation. I'm a huge believer in real estate. I have a lot of real estate in my portfolio. I you know, paid pretty much zero taxes last year because I got all that depreciation. Um, so that was great. And I wanna keep doing that. But I don't want to have 100% of my eggs in that one basket, right? I don't want to have 100% in multifamily common equity, right? So you kind of think of this kind of stratum of what's the asset class I'm in, how do I get some diversification across asset classes, but also how do I diversify in the capital stack? So I want to have some more, you know, what I call kind of bedrock parts of my portfolio, Right. And, I, and right. what one guy I really liked that talked about this is build kind of a, an investment pyramid, right? And Maybe at the very bottom is your investment banking policy. It's just maybe you're, you're only earning four or five, six percent a year, depending on the type of policy you have. It's not crazy, but it's pretty much guaranteed. It's going to keep growing and compound over a long haul. I like having that, right? It's, it's not super sexy, but it's pretty consistent. And then maybe you have a, a debt fund. That's another kind of big piece of this for this cash flow. And maybe you have your investment in some preferred equity, or maybe you're invested in, you know, we were like oil and gas right now. The, the, the cash flow on oil and gas is insane. And we, you know, have funds for that. And then we you go into common equity. So you kind of build this, this pyramid and the lower risk parts at the bottom are going to, you know, produce more consistent cash flow generally, but also preserve capital a lot better. So you have a lot lower risk of uh, losing, losing capital. So Ben, outside of the debt fund, and outside of some common equity and apartment deals, 
that make sense that have the good good debt structure that you mentioned is like staying away from the bad debt structure and then oil and gas is there anything else that your your company is currently looking at or that you're hearing other you know super wealthy looking to invest in yeah so uh we we invest across all asset classes so i say we're asset class agnostic which just is a fancy way of saying we're opportunistic so we look like i said first of the macro trends what's driving growth in certain asset classes then how do we get positioned to to benefit from those trends um and so we've, we've invested in a lot of multifamily. we've invested in a lot of self-storage um we've done even uh, retail investments uh, we actually like neighborhood retail right now the cap the cap rates are really really good and then the kind of two biggest for us at least this year are industrial and oil and gas um aside from the, the our debt fund which just continues to grow and and you know compound over time those are where we see a lot of opportunities and you know kind of going to the other end of the spectrum we're talking about cash flow and you know day one cash flow we we actually think development is is actually a good time to be in development right now so that's kind of the other end of the spectrum on certain asset classes and certain markets we're actually uh, pretty bullish on development for a lot of reasons i could get into if we want to um, but again, if you're as an, as an investor, that sounds really risky, especially in this environment. And yes, there's more risk in development, but in the right deal and the right asset class, um, you're actually not taking as much risk. And um, if you have a portion of your portfolio allocated to those types of deals, we are going to get the 20 to 30 percent IRRs, right? And uh, but you don't want to have 100 percent of your of your portfolio in there. So. You know, we we encourage people to create balance. And again, I'm not a financial advisor, so got to give the caveat. You know, make sure you uh, you know don't take this as investment advice. But you know, having allocations into different buckets is really important. But uh, industrial, we're really big believers in the reshoring trend that we're seeing kind of post COVID. There's a massive, massive tailwind of reshoring, bringing manufacturing and inventory back to the U.S. And this is something that's kind of been under the radar a little bit. You may have heard some of this reshoring. But there was just last year, $1 trillion of economic activity in reshoring that was brought back to the US just in 2022. And this is like the very beginning stages of this massive trend. Um, industrial vacancy is already at all time lows. There's not enough supply. And so that's why we're big believers in development um, of industrial right now because of this massive demand that's coming and there's almost no supply. You're taking a little bit more risk because there's no cash flow, but you got good debt in place where we're, we're doing recourse debt, meaning me and my three partners are signing on the loan that those deals, you know, they don't go well. We're, we're on the hook for to do these deals and, and uh, expect that. Then oil and gas, we're very, you know, very similar kind of reasons, supply and demand. There's some big imbalances. There's, there's a massive constraint of supply, uh, reinvestment into oil and gas producing, uh, projects has decreased by 50% over the past seven years, 50, five, zero. And if you think about oil and gas, it's a finite resource in the ground. As you pull it up, you're depleting what's remaining in there every year. And so on average, about five to 7% of existing oil, oil production is depleted five to 7%. And so you have to always be drilling new projects new wells to keep production higher meanwhile we're projected to hit the highest oil demand oil and gas demand over the next 15 years than we've ever had right it's very different than the esg narrative that we're hearing is that we've hit peak oil demand and alternatives are the, the future maybe they are the future but it's not going to be probably realistic in our lifetimes i mean that's just the fundamental reality and so because of that you have demand that's actually increasing you have supply that is substantially decreasing. We saw the beginning stages of this, if you guys remember last summer when gas prices spiked, right? Everyone got freaked out. Well, I think we're gonna see a lot more of the, that happening, probably gonna see that this summer. Um, and a lot of economists are, are predicting that oil prices are going to go very high. So I say get on the, get on the other side of the pump, right? Instead of paying, paying uh, you know, the gas prices, why don't you be selling the gas prices? Yeah, I, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, if you if you're an owner in that, you're excited when the price is going up. Um, you're participating on that, 
and it makes filling up your car a lot cheaper. Well, Ben, thank you so much for coming on and, and giving us, again, a much different conversation for today. Like a lot of times we get into the backstory of the person we're, we're interviewing to hear how they broke free of the Wall Street mindset and how they started creating cash flow. While you have done that, you've done that while also working in a model with your dad uh, within Aspen Funds and, and being able to just take advantage of the things that he's built. Like I think if Joey and I were sitting here, you know, 10 years from now and our kids were participating in the company, you know, at a high level, we would be super excited, right? Like that's awesome. So thank you so much. If people would love to connect with you further, dig into more about Aspen Funds and the opportunities that exist there, where would you send them to? Yeah, I always first say, hey, if you like podcasts, if you're listening to this, you probably do. Uh, we have our, our own podcast called Invest Like a Billionaire. Um, it's a thebillionairepodcast.com. And uh, we talk a lot about things I talked about today, but in a deeper, deeper way. Um, and then, yeah, if you're interested in investing and learning about opportunities, we have our private equity company, which is Aspen Funds, aspenfunds.us. And uh, we could chat with you over there. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate it, guys. It's, it's really fun to, to do this and um, really enjoyed our time. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening. If you found value here, take time to rate and review the show. I say that every single time. Have you done it yet? If not, please right now, stop what you're doing. <laughs> Unless you're driving. Don't stop doing that. If you're on the treadmill, stop it. Just, just get on the sidebar. Let it run between your legs. You can do it. Hit, hit, give us a review. Tell us about what you, what you like about the show. It helps us so much. Helps other people find the show. And as always, have an amazing day. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.